Now that we've laid out some ways in which the Episcopal Church reoriented itself towards mission in the early 19th century, let's think a little bit more about different ways in which the church engaged in mission. So at first, one is to think about mission to Native American populations. And an early area for this is the mission to the Oneida in the state of New York and then in Wisconsin. The Bishop of New York, uh, John Henry Hobart, continued an Anglican mission in New York to the Oneida. Earlier, the uh, British Anglicans had ministry to the Mohawk in New York. During the Revolutionary War, this Mohawk population is a loyalist, and many of them moved to Canada in order to avoid reprisals from the American forces. In 1819, Hobart confirms 56 Oneida people. He baptizes two adults and 46 infants. But in the year 1822, as part of westward expansion and manifest destiny, the federal government forcibly removes the Oneida to the Duck Creek region of Wisconsin. Hobart does not forget his people, though. And in 1828, he makes what would probably have been a very difficult journey to Wisconsin. And there he meets with the Oneida people there. They have built a church named for him, and he consecrates that church. And it is the first church structure in Wisconsin. In 1838, a decade later, Bishop Jackson Kemper continues this missionary work to the Oneida people. There he consecrates another church for them, and the Oneida language is used by Kemper in the liturgy he performs. Early on, the Oneida church was the only churches consecrated in the whole region of Wisconsin. So here we see how a region of the country is being moved into by the Episcopal Church with the indigenous population. We can also turn our attention to the Oklahoma mission that also begins in the 1830s under Jackson Kemper. He goes to Oklahoma because that is a territory, then it was often called simply Indian Territory, where many different indigenous peoples have been removed to by the uh, American government. There he's seeking these Mohawks from New York that he knew had been Anglican. But by the time he finds the Mohawks in Oklahoma, they have moved on to other forms of Protestantism. In the 1840s, there's another attempt at a series of missions uh, to the Seneca people, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Cherokee, all in this Oklahoma territory. But most of these missionary efforts fail because the institutional church is simply too slow to respond to requests. And rarely when Native Americans are being removed to other territories, does the Episcopal Church intervene on behalf of them. So they're not trusted as agents either. And the Episcopal Church itself has very few infrastructural resources to offer to the indigenous population in these territories. Missionary bishops are severely under-resourced. And so there is a mismatch of need, a mismatch of intent, and a mismatch of resources. The narrative begins to shift uh, in the uh, 1880s. David Pendleton Okerhader was a Cheyenne warrior who was imprisoned at Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida in the year 1874. While he's there, Bishop Whipple of Minnesota has traveled to Florida, uh, essentially to winter there, to get away from the harshness of the Minnesota winters. Okahater, while he is there, is noticed by Whipple and knows that he is converting to the Christian faith. And as a result, Okerhader is released from Fort Marion and travels to Syracuse, New York, where a deaconess by the name of Mary Burnham is running House of the Good Shepherd there, which is a sort of vocational school. And in that educational context, he is ordained as a deacon by the Bishop of New York in 1881. And as a deacon, returns to Oklahoma. 
Now, he's arriving in Oklahoma at the very moment when the territories are being dissolved and a land rush is about to happen. Okrahater uses his warrior status to return to his Cheyenne people and evangelize them. And in the period from 1884 to 1893, Okerhader is actually the only active Episcopal clergy person in the entire Oklahoma Territory. During this time is a time of great trauma for the Cheyenne people. They're moved off of their traditional lands, they're forced to farm, children are sent to government boarding schools, and their land is given to white settlers. So Okerhader then stands in the gap of need for his people. And in a gap where there are very few other resources available and where the Episcopal Church was largely absent. In the Episcopal Church, we often commemorate David Okerhader as the first indigenous Native American priest. And his memory is worth preserving for his resilience and his testimony and witnessing for his people. Let's move north and think about the Ojibwe mission among the Ojibwe people found in the region of what is now Minnesota. In 1850, Jackson Kemper sends James Lloyd Breck, who had been working with the Oneida people in the Wisconsin region, to a mission uh, at St. Paul, Minnesota. And there he works with a variety of people including Enemagoba at Gull Lake, where St. Columba's Church is established. Breck also establishes Seabury Divinity School in Faribault, Minnesota. Now, a big issue that occurs in this context is there is an attack by the Lakota Dakota people on Fort Ridgely in western Minnesota, due to anger over government treatment of them, especially um, the poor quality of government rations and even the lack of access to government rations at various points. As a result of this attack, 307 Dakota men are just indiscriminately rounded up and sentenced to death. Many of them had no involvement in the attack on Fort Ridgely. Because they're Dakota, they're deemed guilty. In this context, Bishop Henry Whipple of Minnesota writes to President Abraham Lincoln and gets the sentences of most of these people commuted so that only 38 are hanged. The hanging of the 38 Lakota Dakota people is still the largest mass execution in American history. Many of these men went to the gallows singing a Lakota hymn that Episcopalians had, had given to them and that had been used in their Episcopalian worship. In 1872, Whipple works so that General Convention creates what is called the Niobrara Missionary District and also a standing committee for Indian Affairs. Now, it must be worth noting that the Standing Committee for Indian Affairs is happening and it's created at the same time that the government is trying to get churches, Protestant churches, to oversee different um, areas where Native Americans are living. And so the Episcopal Church is given oversight of the Lakota Dakota people, the Shoshone people, and the Ponca people. And this leads to an intense series of missionary work in the Great Plains during this time period. And this helps us think about the Niobrara Missionary District in some more detail. In 1868, the Fort Laramie Treaty is signed, and this guarantees that the that was what then is called the Dakota Territory, now North and South Dakota, is given exclusively to the Lakota Dakota people. And whites are excluded from settlement there. There is a group of Episcopalian missionaries that arrives. Uh, Samuel Hinman, Mary Hinman, and Emily West. And they are active among the people in this territory, especially the Santee people 
which is another group living there. Vernacular worship occurs, scripture is translated into the vernacular as well. This work is really significant. So in the year 1935, there are 97 different Native American congregations in the Diocese of South Dakota. This real concentration of Native American Episcopalians leads in 1870 to the establishment of the first Niobrara Convocation, which uh, becomes an annual gathering of Native American Episcopalians, which goes on to this day. In 1872, William Hobart Hare becomes bishop of this Niobrara Missionary District. And he introduces a lot of more further mission and cachesis among these people. Yet, it's also important to note that he has a racist perspective in which he believes the Native Americans need to be civilized. They need to be brought up to white Protestant Christian standards. And so many indigenous people are forced into the boarding school system where much of their indigenous identity is removed, they're separated from their families, and really violations of human dignity occur. And so with this tension of the Episcopal Church being concerned for these people and also eliminating and erasing aspects of their identity and dignity. This all this narrative really ends in some tragedy. In the year 1890 is the slaughter at Wounded Knee Creek on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Pine Ridge has a very high concentration of Lakota, Dakota Episcopalians. And after the slaughter at Wounded Knee, a Lakota priest, Charles Cook, leads the burial of many of the 376 victims of Wounded Knee. The story of the Episcopal Church and Native American populations is a long one. It's a tragic one. It's one that still requires accounting for. But it's also a story of trying to attend to the needs of a population that desperately is needing resources and the gospel. So there's a lot for us to reflect on here about a legacy and a heritage and the question of what is the gospel? in this situation.